Welcome to worship at Cimarron Valley Church, where ordinary people serve an extraordinary God. Today's message is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 45 through 47, entitled Beyond Fear. We now join Pastor Paul Dawson. I want to speak to you this morning a very familiar story we've all heard back in our Sunday school days. It's, it's been noted it's probably one of the most told stories from Scripture, and it is the story of David and Goliath. I'm reading this morning, if you have your Bible and you want to read along with me, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'll talk to you about getting beyond fear. When I, when I reread this story throughout this week, it's just been the story that I've gone to all week long, I realized that in the background of what was happening here with David was a lot of things that sometimes we don't really think about or that we really uh, perceive would have gone on in the mind of a young man like David when he faced this particular day in his life. So I pick it up in verse 45. Then Dan David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Of course, this, this passage reveals heroics. Knowing David at that time, and, and I don't want to take you through a long discourse, but when we measure time in the scripture and through the dates of time that we know of that Scripture revealed to us about the time of King Saul's reign, the time when this happened in, on the sides of this mountain. Uh, all, these, all these pictures, the time that David come to be the real king of Israel, uh, all these give us an idea that David in this particular passage was somewhere between the age of 15 and 18. So he was a young man. He wasn't allowed to be in the army as of yet because in the book of Numbers it tells us that you had to be at least 20 years old to be a part of the Israelite army. So we know that he is much younger than that. But just through the reading of Scripture and the study of times and that sort of thing, we perceive that he's somewhere between 15 and 18. Now, the reason I point that out to you is because I want us to try to get our, our minds in the mindset of a 15 or an 18-year-old boy. I also want to remind us that David was no more than just a farm kid. He kept sheep. He, he wasn't a wrangler. He, 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 he kept sheep. He was a, a small-time shepherd. And the reason that he was present this day was because one of the ways that his family had of making a living was selling, and if you read the, the passage prior to this, this entire chapter, his dad sent him down with provisions, and he told, his, he told David, now when you come back, bring a pledge. In other words, let, make them sign for what I sent to them so that I can get reimbursed for the goods. It was a way of making a living. So the scripture says that David left his sheep with a keeper and that the next morning early he left to go down to where 
the Israelites were fighting against the Philistines. Now, battle in Bible times is a lot different than what we're accustomed to seeing on our TV screens when it comes to war and battles. What would happen in Bible times is that one army would line itself up against the other army lined up, and they would meet in the middle. And in this particular case, the Scripture reveals that the Philistines were on one side of a mountain, and then the valley before them, and the Israelites were on the other mountain, and a valley between them. So this, this was the picture of what was happening that particular day. So it would have been easy for David to find his brothers in the line. And we know that his three older brothers were a part of this Israelite army that the Philistines were defying. And David goes to them to let them know that things are well at home, that dad's okay. And you read the scripture, it says that his dad was becoming a feeble person, an elderly man, and letting them know that all is well. And then as you read the scripture, it says that while this was going on, this greeting and meeting was going on, that a man from the Philistines walked down into the valley and shouted to the armies of Israel and told them to send out a man. And if they would send out a man, he and this man would take care of this entire war scene, that the winner what would happen is, if he wins, the armies of Israel would bow to the army of the Philistines, and vice versa. But as of yet, and we read in the scripture that this went on for 40 days, the Israelites had never sent a man. Now, your scripture will tell you that he was about six cubics high. Modern measurements has him a little bit over seven foot. Now, I know we've heard all kinds of measurements, but a little over seven foot. But also that he was heavily armored. Also that he had all the tools of weaponry that was available to him that particular time of history. He even had an armor bearer that went out before him. So this man, no doubt, was very intimidating. I picture him as a large man, heavily armored, with a small armor bearer carrying his shield in front of him, and with a loud, boisterous voice, very intimidating, very fearful. And the reason I believe that is because for 40 days, he threatened and dared anyone from the Israelite army to come and to meet him in a battle. And yet there were no takers. No one was going down to meet Goliath. When David heard this booming voice echoing from the valley up into the mountain where the armies of Israel stood, David began to ask the question, why is nobody going? Why are we letting this fella defy the army of the Lord? Why is this going on? Why is this happening? What has been promised to someone who will go and defeat this defying foe? David learned from the soldiers that were present that anyone who would meet this guy and defeat him, that he would be given wealth, the hand of the king's daughter, and that his family would never have to pay tax again. But that wasn't enough for anyone to take on this giant. David went through the ranks and talked this way. His brother, his oldest brother, Eliab, told him to shut up and go home and tend the sheep. What did you come out here to do? What is it you're trying to do? Make us all look bad? His older brother said, and David said to him, I haven't done anything. Somebody needs to take up arms against this foe. 
And for the first time, David probably knew what fear was like coming from another person. But this wasn't David's first time to ever experience fear. In short, word got to Saul that this young man, David, was down there questioning this, and Saul had him brought before him. And even in front of King Saul, this young teenager says to Saul, somebody needs to go out there. If nobody will go, I'll go. Saul even called him, you're just a boy. He's been a soldier since his youth. This is a professional soldier, a professional warrior. This is not just another Philistine. This is a professional warrior. And David said, I'll go. The king began to reason with him as to why he couldn't go. But David had something to say. And that's the first thing I want to share with you on how to get beyond fear this morning. That is preparation. Faithful preparation has to take place. See, David let King Saul know, I'm ready for this. What qualifies me to be ready for this? While one of my little lambs was picked up in the mouth of a lion, and I delivered that lamb from the mouth of that lion. A bear came and attacked my flock, took one of my little lambs, and I attacked that bear. Read in the scripture what he said. I grabbed him by the jaw. I beat him with a club. He let loose my lamb. In David's mind, he was prepared for this intimidating moment. Now, you and I don't have to go against a lion, a bear, or even a giant. But aren't there times in our lives when fear arises? and intimidation comes? Aren't there moments in our lives when the unknown causes us to be fearful? It could be even small things to what others would think. For instance, if, if you have some type of a paranoia, in my case, I'm very highly claustrophobic. When they want to put me through that tube for an MRI, I'm telling you for days, up until that moment in time, I am an uneasy and under much stress. If you talk to me during those days and you think I'm a mean person, I'm really not. I'm just under a lot of stress right now. The morning of is highly stressful for me. I can think of every reason in the world why I do not have to do this. And you know what? There's nothing to it, right? It's just the fear that grips the heart. How about this? There are people, and I know one in this congregation especially, that has no fear of snakes. And it's not some big brawny guy in here either, so it's a little lady. Ruby has no fear of snakes. I know this for a fact because one jumped out of her flower bed when I was talking to her one Saturday morning. And I was ready to kill. I was ready, I was ready to do away with this nasty thing. Not Ruby. No, 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 don't you kill my snake. He takes care of things around here. I watched as that snake climbed a tree, wrapped itself up around a branch up top. I said one thing as I left her house. If he crosses that road, when he gets to the middle, he's dead. Why? Because I have a fear. Do you have a fear? I don't care whether they're venomous or not. It's just a fear. We all all have fears. If I were to go around the room this morning, you would tell me of some fear you have. For instance, I I can drive fast, but I don't like to ride with people that drive fast. Billy Foote scared me to death one afternoon when he was trying out his son's new Jeep. I just knew we were going to land in the pasture field. I like the speed, but I got to be in control or I'm fearful. Kathy doesn't speed, but I'm, and she's a good driver, so don't, 
but she's driving and I'm not, and I'm afraid. There's a certain fears that we have that we have to overcome. It's knowing that we can't overcome this. David, I believe, as a young kid out there watching his flocks, the first time he saw a bear or a lion, I have to believe that there was, a, there was some fear that came to his heart. But he overcame that fear. What happened was the lamb to him was more precious than the fear that he had of the beast that had come to take the lamb. I've seen moms respond in crucial situations in ways that I would never believe when it came to the safety of a child. They overcome all fear. They are prepared. And David says to King Saul, I'm prepared. I am ready. I am beyond the fear of this man. I believe he needs to be dealt with. Not only was he prepared, and he was faithful in his being prepared, but he was, he was also practiced. For all those who go hunting, the first thing you do with your weapon when you hunt is you make sure that it fires properly. You keep it aligned. When we were in the military, we would have to go out periodically to the rifle range and make sure that our weapon operated the way that it should operate, even in tense situations. They wanted us to know this weapon so well that they would blindfold us, and in two minutes you had to take it apart and put it back together properly and make sure that it would fire. So that if you were ever in the darkness and it misfired, you would know exactly what to do and how to respond. It was all practiced. See, I believe the day that David raced toward Goliath with a sling in his hand that he was practiced. Now, he might not have had tin cans in his day to set up out there on a stone just to pass the time of day while he was shepherding that flock. But I'll promise you that there was something he looked at and slung that rock at through that sling to where he was confident that he could accomplish what he needed to accomplish. He practiced and he practiced and he practiced until he was an expert marksman with this slingshot. I'm wondering for the fears that we face if we practice. You say, Pastor, how do you practice? How about our time with the Lord? See, I found one thing that I could do when I'm inside that tube. You know what I do? Very serious with you. I pray in my mind. I may even preach a sermon while I'm in there. And trust me, I've preached some long ones in there. They need to pull me out of here, but I'm still preaching, trying to get through. It's all going on up here. It was my, it's my way. I may be quoting scriptures in my mind, but I have to do something. I have to be ready for this moment. You may look at that as me being an inferior person, and that's okay, but it's a fear. It's something that grips and, and, and causes, causes you to be just stone quiet. It grips you so hard, but I have found that the answer is what I have practiced, letting the scriptures run through my mind, singing in my mind some of the songs that we sing right here at church, praying in my mind good thoughts towards God, communicating with the Lord. That needs to be a practice in every Christian's life. We never know what we may come up against we need to be practiced. Someone says, I don't know how to pray. Prayer is simply a communication that you have with God. Usually it's the people that know how to talk the most that tell me they don't know how to pray. Yes, you do, because you know how to talk. 
And all you have to do is talk to God. In your mind, the thoughts that go through, the Holy Spirit knows. Practice. David practiced. He practiced and he practiced. He was an expert with a slingshot. Now, I don't know if it was the crudely made ones like we used to make when I was a kid where, you know, you had the rubber bands and they pulled back. I'm thinking more it was something that they swung and tossed is what the description gives from the scriptures. But he was deadly with a slingshot. Now, Saul said, here's my helmet of brass. Here's my armor. Here's my sword. Now, if you know anything about Saul, You've read in the scripture where he stood head and shoulders above every Israelite. Now, i got a question for you here. Why doesn't he go out there and meet that fellow? Not Saul. But he stood head and shoulders. The scripture describes him as such above all others. What do you think it was like for a 15 to an 18-year-old boy? And trust me, we're usually skinny during those years if we worked as a farm boy at all. I got pictures to prove it. That armor did not fit. The Bible said that he walked around with it. I can just hear it clanging and banging against a stone floor. It just wasn't going to work. And here's why he had never practiced it. Later in life, David became an expert with the sword. I've read about it. He was the greatest warrior of the Israelite army. But not today. Not today. He hadn't practiced. So he took off the armor. He picked up his slingshot. He walked down the side of that mountain. There was a brook in the middle of that valley. And at that brook, he stopped and picked up five smooth stones, the scripture tells us, and he put them in his shepherd's bag. And then he heard the booming voice of this giant as it echoed across that valley, defying God and the armies of God. And then I read something that to me was rather Unique in verse 48, and so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. They tell us that our first responders run to the danger while the rest of us run away from the danger, and that's truth. I see David as a first responder running to the danger that he faced that day. Because David, after his preparation in life up to this point, after practicing with this slingshot during his life, David now had a purpose in mind. And I read it to you in the text this morning. For he said to Goliath, it's not about me. It's not about me. You say, I didn't read that. Yeah, you did. He didn't say, I come to you in the power and strength and marksmanship of David. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven. And the whole purpose in this happening today is that the armies of the Philistine and even the armies of Israel will know that there is a God in heaven. And I don't need a sword, a spear, or a javelin to meet you today. I've come with what I have. See, we have to face our fears with what we have. And that's why we need the strength of the Lord in our hearts and in our lives. That's why we need to repent of our sin and live a life that is righteous and holy before God and pleasing to God. (coughs) That's why we need to be the people that we need to be, so that when this, these moments of terror come to our lives, like we see on the news and all that's happening, and all the people of the world speaking against the, the people of God, and against Christianity, and against the church, and against all that stands for good and righteousness, 
we need to understand that our God is bigger than all of this and put our total faith and trust in him. It's for his glory that we live, not our own. And I see that happening too much in our world, especially in the gospel kingdom, is too many people want recognition. The recognition and glory needs to go to God himself. It is by the grace of God that we stand as we stand. It is by the grace of God that we face our fears and are bold. It is by the grace of God Almighty that we live and stand, that he might receive the glory. God wants us to point others to him, not ourselves. We need to get beyond ourselves. Because when we get beyond ourselves, we will get, get beyond the fears that cause us to freeze. The intimidation that comes. When we come to understand God's word when it says to us that the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, that we need to stand strong with our God. We need to be like the Apostle Paul, who said in these words, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm fine. I'll be okay. I'm all right, he was saying. Did fear grip his heart at moments and times? I'm sure it did because the human factor was there. But he came to realize that trust and faith in God will see you through in this life and you can get beyond your fear. I have a passage of scripture I want to remind you of this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul said these words, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. The Holy Spirit within you and within me. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of authority, of love. Authority and love. Do you see the the two contrasts there in those words? And then of a sound mind. How do you keep your mind sound? By staying in his word, by staying in a spirit of prayer and praise, you keep a sound mind. You don't lose your wits when things come against you. You realize that God is in control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, Paul says, nor be a prisoner. I sense that's happening in the church all around the world, that we're starting to run and hide and be ashamed of this gospel. Let me tell you something before I close this morning. This gospel has been around since the civilization of man. It isn't going anywhere. There have been tyrants who have come to try to wipe it out. No one has been successful in over 6,000 years to wipe this out. And it's been powerful people that have tried to steal the voice of the gospel kingdom of God. And those lie cold in their grave this morning while this is still alive and well. You serve a mighty God. You have no reason to fear. You have no reason to be intimidated when you stand upon God's truth. I have put this to test. Many in here have put this to the test, and God always comes through. It may not be in my time zone. It may not be as I want him to do it, but I can assure you of this, that God has always delivered right on time with exactly that what was needed that the wisdom of God far surpasses my wisdom and yours. The knowledge of God far surpasses your knowledge and mine, that God always knows what's best. For I read in here, and this helps me every time I face my fears, that God has ordered 
the steps of a righteous man. 